Good morning. morning. Joy to be with you all. I was just reflecting. uh, I uh, moved to Wheaton in 1945. Some some of you weren't born then. (laughs) And uh, I was remembering that uh, here where the Billy Graham Center is, there was a row of houses. And Coach Lee Fund was living in those. And uh, some of my friends from College Church across the way where I went to church, uh, we were a bit rowdy one night, and so we were driving around in a car, and uh, we were making a lot of noise, and there was a circular drive around the house, and all of a sudden we saw a flashing red light, and uh, Coach Fund had called the police on us, and uh, we got picked up. That happened right about here. <laughs> so I have good memories of uh, this place. Maybe not what you would have thought, But uh, the joys of growing up uh, in little Jerusalem here, uh, where everything emanates. Well, a joy to be with you. Um, Who would have thought, when I was a student here, that I would be involved in what I'm involved in? It would have been the last thing you would have ever, I would have ever expected. Because by nature, I'm an introvert. Uh, Honestly, when I was a student at Wheaton, evangelism was a bad word. I was turned off by people who talked about evangelism. In fact, the only people I knew who talked about evangelism seemed to me to be obnoxious, grabbing people by the throat, and I said, that's not me. I don't want to be like that. And I really struggled with that. In fact, I came to Christ as a young person, But for me, the Christian life was a real struggle because I didn't understand how to walk by faith. I'd heard wonderful messages. I thank God for the wonderful heritage uh, that I had here at Wheaton and College Church and so many. But for me, I was a slow learner. And somehow, I got under a legalistic idea that I had to earn God's favor by what I did and that uh, I had to gut it out to try real hard to be a Christian. And it seemed like the harder I tried, the worse I did, the more frustrated I got until, frankly, at the beginning of my senior year here at Wheaton, I was just about ready to chuck the whole thing. I was that close. What kept me from doing it was the consistent walk of my dad. I never saw my dad uh, live in a dishonest way. He was totally honest. His walk matched his talk. He loved my mom. And when I was tempted to chuck it, my dad's testimony came in front of me. And I thought, you know, it's real to dad, but boy, God isn't real to me. I was in chapel every day. I was going to class. I knew all that. But for me, it was more of a tradition, more of just sort of going through the motions rather than a personal dynamic relationship with Jesus. And so I began to pray, God, if you're real, make yourself real to me. Is this true or is this just a bunch of fairy tales? Is this really significant? Can you really change my life? And you know, as I struggle with that, I realize now that I had to be honest with God to begin to find solutions. To say, you know, Lord, this is who I really am. And even though I know all the answers intellectually, I could give you all the answers that all of us know, but it wasn't being lived out in my life. For me, it was more like, as it were, tipping my hat to God on Sunday and then living the rest of the week as though God was nowhere around. Now, sure, I was in chapel, I was in Bible, but it was more of not really a personal kind of relationship. My senior year, Uh, something happened that was life-changing for me. A guy came on campus, and uh, actually, I will say, I went to play soccer. I was on the soccer team. We went to play Michigan State, and one of my teammates looked at me. He said, Green, he said, what's the matter with us? We go to Wheaton, we go to Chapel, we do all these things, but really, you know, our lives are not much different than someone who doesn't claim to be a Christian, except there are certain things we don't do. I said, yeah, you know, my Christian life was defined by what I didn't do. Smoking, drinking, dancing, you know, the whole list. It wasn't defined by a dynamic, active faith that was making a difference in my life and in the lives of others. 
And so we actually got down on our knees and we prayed at Michigan State and Kellogg Center. And we said, God, we're tired of just going through the motions. How can you really be dynamic and real in our lives? Well, I got back from that trip and the phone rang and a guy I'd worked for the summer before uh, selling cookware to engage girls was on the line. And uh, <laughs> he said, Jim, Bill Bright, who founded Campus Crusade, is going to be in town. I'd like you to meet him. Well, man, I about dropped the phone because the night before I'd prayed this help prayer. And now this guy is saying, Bill Bright's in town. I want you to meet him. Man, I was scared spitless because I was sure he was going to ask me how many people I'd led to Christ and all this kind of stuff. And I'd never even witnessed in my whole life. You know, I was so shy, the idea of talking to someone about Christ just totally scared me to death. So I said, okay, I'll meet with him. And he said, well, we're going to have a leadership training class on campus. And he said, in that class, we're going to share with you how God can give you the power to live the Christian life. And, you know, I realized that was my problem. I didn't have the power to live the Christian life. I was trying in my own strength. And basically what he shared, the guy that shared, was the, the understanding of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'd heard all about the Holy Spirit all my life, but I'd never understood how to appropriate the power of the Holy Spirit in my own life. It was more of an intellectual understanding rather than an application of the power of the Holy Spirit in my own life. And that night, for the first time in my life, I began to understand. I say began because for me it's been a journey of learning every day more and more how to give my life to Christ and live in the power of the Spirit. And then also to reach out in evangelism. You know, I had great faith at that point in my life. Great faith that God couldn't use me. <laughs> and have you identified? You know, I was sure God could use the great charismatic speakers who stand up and and my attitude was you know I'm just supposed to sit back and applaud and pray for them and boy they're God's men and God's women but me I don't have anything really to offer I, I how could God use me I'm not a great speaker I'm just normal average everyday person and that began a journey on my life that I said Lord if it takes me the rest of my life I want to learn how I can be your instrument to help engage people with Jesus so people around the world can come to know him. And I'm still on that journey, but by God's grace, God has, by his grace, enabled me to take some steps of faith in that regard. Bill Bright, my end of my senior year, and he challenged me to think about coming with Campus Crusade for Christ. Well, I was scared to death again. And he looked at me and said, you know the greatest qualification to come into ministry and specifically on our staff? I said, what's that? He said, a feeling of inadequacy. I said, man, am I overqualified. <laughs> and I still feel like that today, 49 years later. Because I made the discovery, it's not about my ability, but it's about my availability. It's not the gifting or the experience or the gifts that I have, but it's about making myself available to the Holy Spirit. And I love the story of Moses in the burning bush. If you remember, God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Now, we lived up in the desert of Mali afterwards, and we saw that a desert bush wouldn't win a beauty contest. But what was unique about that bush? God was in it. And one person said one day, you know, any old bush will do if God's in it. God is in the business of taking any old bush if we're committed to him and available to him and using us beyond what we could ever imagine. And really what God is doing in our world today is raising up a whole army of men and women who are becoming available to him to be his instruments to build his kingdom. We read this morning this wonderful passage from Daniel where he gave him a vision and he said that all the nations of the world, every race, every nation, every language would obey him and his rule is eternal. It is never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. You know what he's saying there is the kingdom of God is not in doubt. We know the end of the story. It's what God is doing. 
Now, one of the problems that we have in our world today as American Christians, it, we're at risk of becoming what I call CNN or Fox or secular news Christians. Our worldview is shaped by what we're hearing from secular news. And what we forget is that God is working in incredible ways around the world. And I'd like to just share with you a little bit of some of the things that I'm aware of that God is doing in our world today. And as I share this, what I've seen is that, you know, so many believers come up to me as I've shared this kind of message, and they say, you know, we've never, we never hear stuff. All we hear about is what the devil's doing. It's like a friend here when I was at Wheaton one day, we got in the car and he turned on the radio. I said, let's hear what the devil's doing. Well, you know, if you turn on the radio or TV or go on the Internet, you're going to hear what the devil's doing. You're not going to hear what God's doing. But God is doing incredible things. He is building his kingdom. And one of the things that God is doing today is the mobilization of believers around the world. Now, you know, when I was involved as a student here in Wheaton, my impression was that it was pretty much a few stars trying to do it and the rest of us sitting back and saying, you know, go, brother, go ahead and do it. It reminds me of the wonderful story that Billy Graham used to tell. He said, you know, the Christian life is a lot like a great football stadium. He said there's 20,000 people in the grandstands and 22 players down on the field. And the 22 players down the field are desperately in need of rest and the 22,000 in the grandstands are desperately in need of exercise. <laughs> well, that's a pretty good picture of what used to be in the body of Christ, but that's changing. And what God is doing today is he's mobilizing his people around the world to step up, to lift up Jesus, to reach out in love and compassion and make Jesus available to people everywhere. I dream of the day when Jesus will be available to everyone and there will be true followers of Jesus in every place, in every language, every culture, every geography, every tongue, every nation. That's the picture that God says. In fact, he says to us that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That's saturation. God is doing that. And how is he doing it? Well, one of the things that he's doing is mobilizing believers. You know about the Back to Jerusalem movement, people being mobilized to go back through those unreached, resistant areas of the world to share good news. Someone said one day, I'm just waiting for the day when a dear Chinese believer knocks on the door of Osama bin Laden and says, have you ever heard of Jesus? Yes. Chinese people being mobilized to go to hard places, places where the gospel has never gone. YWAM, in the last few, uh, several years, have mobilized over 4 million people to go into Christian ministry. Around our or own organization, Campus Crusade, we're seeing incredible mobilization taking place. A friend of mine was just at a student conference. He said there were 3,000 Korean students, and they challenged them to give their lives them, and 2,000 of them stood up with excitement and said, yes, we want to give our lives for the kingdom, however the Lord leads us to follow him. We had a student conference in Ethiopia. 7,300 students came. They lived in the homes of people. They had a whole week talking about how they would be involved in sharing Christ. And uh, what was incredible was in, in addition to witnessing and sharing Christ, they planted 40,000 trees in one day because this is a place of great need. And uh, the mayor was so excited, he held a special thank you, and he thanked them, and he said, uh, but you know, I'm really sad because, you know, we're in drought and all those trees are going to die. And the student said, no problem, we'll just pray that God will send rain. And they did, and 10 minutes later, a big rainstorm came, and God watered all the trees. And then some of the students got all of excited, and they went to an area that was totally resistant to the gospel and began to share, and they were thrown in jail for 29 days. Now, the guy who was the prison warden wasn't too 
swift. And so what he did is he moved them from cell to cell every day. And the result was, in 29 days, they witnessed to 1,100 prisoners. <laughs> and many of them came to Christ, and their whole lives were impacted. God is raising up an army of students around the world, of people. As I go and we uh, meet with people around the world, we're sort of a, uh, a rallying point because the Jesus film is being used by people all over the world. And we see that uh, never before are we seeing people going on mission trips and people involved. I know it's happening here from Wheaton, but it's happening all over the world. That was not the case 40 years ago. We're seeing great mobilization take place around the world. One of my friends used to put it this way. He said, you know, the great commission will not be fulfilled by someone trying to reach everyone, but by everyone trying to reach someone. It's all about mobilizing. Now, that's exactly what the Word of God said. Jesus said the fields are what? Ripe, Ripe for harvest. And then what did he say? Pray for more laborers. It was all about the mobilization of laborers, of getting more people involved, all of us having a part. And that's the exciting thing that we're seeing happening in our world today. Now, also, the body of Christ is working together as never before. Again, when I was a student here at Wheaton, frankly... There wasn't a lot of that going on. We were all in our little silos. And in the last several years, there's been a coming together of people working together in the body of Christ. For example, I'm aware of what we're doing with Wycliffe and Table 71, a massive partnership involving 50,000 missionaries working together to get to the last unreached, unengaged people of the world. A few years ago, five years ago, we were able to say it through research at least there were 639 unengaged, unreached people groups that had never been exposed to the gospel. And in the last five years, that's gone down now to only 100 of those remaining. 17 left that people haven't said that we want to engage to go to those people groups. And that's working together in partnerships between different organizations where we're saying, let's park our logos at the door and let's work together and form strategic alliances to work together for the kingdom so that our goal is not to build our own thing, but to build the kingdom of God, working together for the glory of the Lord. Scripture translation has accelerated as never before. In fact, it used to take 13 years to get enough Bible translated to start a church. Now it only takes two years, and it's declining. And Wycliffe now has set a goal that there will be translation in place for every single language that will need translation by 2025. It used to be that our goal was 150 years from now. Now it's down to 2025. So God is moving in an incredible way. In the Jesus film, as he alluded to, we've seen over 6 billion viewings of the Jesus film. Everywhere we go, we see that Jesus is being lifted up. We're hearing people talking about dreams of Jesus in incredible ways. I don't have the time this morning to tell you, but so many times we show the Jesus film and people say, I had a vision of Jesus before you came. And by the way, that's the same one that I saw in my vision. Now, who's doing that? God's doing that. God is working in a supernatural way. Also, God is working through crises. We just heard about this terrible crisis, but I remember being in Mali, West Africa, where faithful missionaries have worked for many years with little results, and then a famine came. And as Christians were mobilized, we showed the Jesus film, and, and food and relief aid was given to resistant people. In the next few years, over 15,000 People from another tradition came to faith in Christ. And the missionaries and the workers couldn't keep up with it. There were so many people coming to Christ where there had been resistance. And Haiti, the same thing. There was two times the response to the gospel after the recent earthquake in Haiti. The last tsunami that took place over in Asia and spread all over the Pacific, there was incredible openness afterwards and many people coming to Christ as a result of hearing about this. Well, there's so many things I could go on and say this morning, but our time is limited.
But my point is, God is working in our day. He is building his kingdom, and his kingdom is not in doubt. Now, the question is, I'd like to pose to you the same question that Bill Bright asked me when I was a senior here at Wheaton. He said, Jim, let me ask you a question. What's the greatest thing that's ever happened to you? Well, once I understood how to walk with Jesus and experience his presence and his joy in a daily way, I said, coming to know Jesus. And then he said, well, what's the greatest thing you could ever do for somebody else? Share that same possibility with them. And then he sort of said, well, do you know how to do it? I said, well, not really. And so he challenged me to think about coming with Campus Crusade. The point I'm making is to get yourself in a situation where you can learn how to be effective. Take the time. It's not just head knowledge but it's learning how to relate to people in a way that really helps them connect with Jesus. I'll be very honest. Even though we served in Africa for 14 years, the most cross-cultural experience of my life was not going to Africa. It was going from Wheaton to Michigan State, learning how to relate Jesus to secular university students or to Wisconsin so they could really connect with him and that's why I'm so passionate today about the use of visual stories, the opportunity to lift up Jesus in a way that will connect. We live in what we call the screenager generation. It's all about visual stories. 90% of internet traffic by 2013, Cisco is telling us, will be visual, be videos. We live in a visual world, and what we're committed to in the Jesus film is creating visual content that lifts up Jesus in a way that people connect with him and then know how to walk with him to be true followers of Jesus. I'd like to challenge you to think about joining us in that venture, not just us, but the body of Christ as we work together to see the fact that Jesus will be for everyone in every tribe and tongue and language in the next few years, and they'll be true followers of Jesus in every place. Thank you. God bless you.